Hey there, this is John Frenet with the Maryland Crabs podcast. We're going to get right into this week's episode with Jana Davis from Chesapeake Bay Trust, but I wanted to give you a heads up that we are going to be having a special episode released this evening right about 6 p.m. with Mayor Michael Panalides, where we will discuss the recent termination of Annapolis Police Chief Michael Pristoop. So keep an eye on your phone. We'll have a second episode a little bit later on tonight. This is Governor Larry Hogan, and I don't always have time to listen to podcasts, but uh, I do enjoy listening to the Maryland Crabs podcast. Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. Welcome back to the Maryland Crabs. This is John Frenet. I've got Tim Hamilton and we gone on a road trip again and this time we are down on west street sort of across from the ram's head stan and joe's we're at the chesapeake bay trust and this week we're going to be speaking with dr Jana davis who is the executive director and she's been the executive director for not a whole long time but probably about five or six years and we're going to hear i mean it's a tough time of the year it's not a tough time it's a good time of the year for them because we've got tax time and you've got opportunities to really help the bay the general session is in in full swing. So there's, we're going to talk about some legislation, what you can do to help the Bay, uh, what they're doing to help the Bay, um, which is a lot of good stuff. I just saw something where they gave out gazillions of dollars, and I may be exaggerating that by a, maybe a gazillion or so, but close enough. Um, but that's that. You want to welcome Dr. Davis. How are yeah, you? Well, Great. I'm doctor because my shoulder is killing me. So just, <laughs> if you were, this, if you want to look at it. If cool. you were a fish, I could help you, but unfortunately. <laughs> Would you really? That kind of doctor? Uh, probably not. Okay. I knew you were bluffing. <laughs> That's fun. Um, Chesapeake Bay Trust, you're not you're not the foundation. And do you get confused on that a lot? We do. do you? There's, you know, there are a lot of different organizations that are focused on Chesapeake Bay issues. And each of us has a role, but we understand from the outside it can be a little confusing. Right. So Chesapeake Bay Foundation is one of our partner organizations. We uh, make grants to them all the time. Um, they're fantastic. They focus on the advocacy side and the education side. And, and the you guys are like the money side. We're the money side. So we are not an advocacy organization. We don't do anything political. Um, we make grants. So all we do all day long here is the money comes in from the Bay Plate, the tax checkoff, and other sources, and we uh, put the, those dollars back out in the community for projects to do K through 12 environmental education, on the ground restoration, and projects like that. So you're fine. You're finding the money. We find um, the money, and then we spend the money. And then you spend the money. Right. <laughs> Were we married at one point? <laughs> um, <that's, laughs> um, we like to consider it like gift giving. So it's, for us, every day is like the holidays because we get to make gifts and grants to amazing organizations that do such fantastic work. So right, it's like so, shopping. So we walked in, and we passed the the uh, conference room. It was a big class conference room. It was a very mm-hmm. beautiful space where you have – Look like college kids. This is so young. It makes me feel old here. It's like <laughs> Logan's Run. I had a little light on my palm or whatever. It's just everyone here is so young and vibrant. And they had the big, uh, the, the overhead projector and they had, they were pouring over numbers and, and yeah. grants and everything there. Yeah, just we very do a lot, busy. a lot of budget and money things here. One of the things that we pride ourselves in is that, um, when we make awards, when we allocate dollars to grants, we do it in a really rigorous and transparent way. So we have external peer review committees that come in and help us review grant proposals. They're rated according to criteria that are published. So everybody knows it's, you know, all, all out there. And then the, the top ranked proposals get funding. And unfortunately, sometimes the ones that are not ranked as high don't get funding. And we try to work with them to make their proposals better for next time. So what you saw in our conference room right now is one of our technical review committees where we bring in people from the outside to help us evaluate proposals. Oh, very cool. So, yeah. very cool. Now, how, how did you how did you personally land here at the Chesapeake Bay Trust? Yeah, you know, I love it here. I've been the director for almost five years now, as you mentioned, but I've been here for about 11 years um, in different roles before that. And I came here from a fellowship to bring scientists to the Hill. So I was working in Congress okay. um, for a year and a half or so. And before that, I was a real scientist <laughs> in well, the scientific Scientists community. aren't needed on the Hill anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, one could argue that they're needed even more now, yeah. right? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so that's how I came here. You know, my background is uh, as a scientist, but I had always been interested in management What kind policy. of scientist? Uh, my 
degrees in oceanography. Mm. So I was sort of joking about the fish thing. Where did you go to school? Um, my graduate work was done at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is out in uh, San Diego. Yeah, oh, nice yeah. place. Nice yeah. place. Gorgeous, but not um, not as beautiful as the bay. So so the resources of the bay and the Bay Trust, Chesapeake Bay Trust, is not certainly not foreign to you at all. Uh, uh, I mean, with, no, uh, with yeah. A, with a dozen years under your belt, to, <laughs> uh, to so, so to speak there. Um, we briefly mentioned that it's tax time. And if my numbers are right, I think 35 is the box number, is it? It is line 35. Okay. Absolutely. But when you, for those of us who fill out our taxes on TurboTax or tax cut mm-hmm. or one of those, um, it'll just pop up at the end as an optional um, donation line if you want to give. And there's a couple different options. And the Chesapeake and Endangered Species Fund is the one that helps both wildlife all over Maryland as well as Chesapeake Bay issues. Do you do taxes every year? <laughs> yeah. That seems like a hassle, dude. That would explain why it took you four years to get that refund. I got it, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that is, is that, is that one of, is that a, a huge, do you get, do you see a lot of people doing that? Do you know? I mean, obviously you're not seeing people's returns, but I mean, is that a big check that the state treasury writes to you? It is a huge check and it's a great help to us. Um, it funds a lot of K through 12 environmental education field trips. Um, we do, it's one of our two major sources of funding. So we really appreciate the, the, the folks that contribute. What's the average? Donation, do you know? $32 is the average you donation. I just happened to have I just that. happened to have that on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> um, 32 bucks, and, and is that sort of a rounding type thing, you think? Um, it might be. Th- or whatever it is. Th- yeah, $32.67. Okay. But Interesting. I got to see yeah. how I – okay, so when I do my taxes, I need to keep up with the Joneses at $32. i have always <laughs> I've always checked it, and uh, I, think, I, think it's, I think I'm a $25 guy, but uh, – We appreciate whatever amount anyone gets. <laughs> <laughs> I just see this check coming. It's like 5 bucks, and you just go, what the hell is this? I'm just throwing it across your desk. No, we – honestly, I sometimes we have a direct donor campaign here, too, and sometimes people will literally put a dollar in an envelope and send it in, and I really appreciate those. It's somebody who really cares and wants to do something but just can't well, you do know that. there's some there's somebody that that cares mm-hmm. that took the time right and the effort to do it and obviously that's something that's important to them uh even when you know money may not be well money is certainly important to them but it's not you know so they they were able to do that right um and you said that's one of your biggest um income sources of income is mm-hmm. the tax returns which everybody should check box 35 and then put a donation in mm-hmm. what's what's the other one uh, the Bay Plate is, of course, our uh, major source of revenue. Okay. Uh, so about 400,000 Marylanders have a Chesapeake Bay license plate. They're the blue ones with the heron and the crab. Mm-hmm. So it's like one in 10. It's, yeah, yeah, one, yeah, in, one in 12-ish. Yeah. We have, that, was, um, that was designed by Joe Barson, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Was, was it a contest? Was it that? was, yeah. Uh, Joe Barson, he's a uh, citizen pride. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and he, he did the um, film festival logos. Right. He's done uh, the Annapolis podcast logo. Mm-hmm. And his, his work's all over the place. Mm-hmm. Down at the um, locally by design store, that little tiny store down on next to O'Brien's down on Main right. Street. He's got a lot of stuff in there. He does a lot of flags and uh, oh, really yeah, base centric. I have a bunch of his stuff. I forgot about that guy. Yeah. He's it's realized- a really popular design. Uh, m- the majority of Marylanders, when polled, say they like it the best of all of the different options. Mm-hmm. So um, we're thrilled. We've had this design for about 12 or 13 years now. So, right. yeah, it's still very popular. You guys going to redesign it soon? or maybe? I don't know. You know, it's so hard because to us, it seems ideal. It's the ideal color. It's got our two, you know, bay species right, so on there. Right, you've got the crab and the, uh-huh. uh, and the heron. And the heron. And, of course, they have names. And what, yeah, what was it? Claude and... Claudia is the crab. Crab. But cute, right? Claudia. Mm, right. Get it? Um, and Wade, Wade is that's right. the, the heron. That's oh, right. that, you had a contest for that. We did. I entered the contest. Two Fantastic. Summers, I, I, two hope, summers I hope you won. No, I did not win. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I went for Turlock. Turlock? Yeah, of Chesapeake. Didn't you guys read Chesapeake? Mitchner? Oh, yeah. That's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're staring at me won. blankly. Maybe it was, a, <laughs> it was a little deep for the rest of us. I personally was rooting for Grant because that's what we do here. Right. Yeah, we make grants. But I, was, you know, I, I totally wouldn't have picked that up. <laughs> right. yeah. That was a little too subtle for me. I never would have picked that up. Yeah. So Wade was a perfect choice, and we had people vote, and the public voted on their favorite name. Right. Um or people. Oh, that's okay. Go get the phone. We can sit there. And we'll yeah, we'll fill. <laughs> usually it's John's phone that's doing that. Yeah, it's usually. Uh, but uh, do you find, are, are people still buying plates? Or are they still, or is pretty much, has that pond been fished No, out? we get uh, about 50,000 new people buy plates each year. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. So it's still going strong. It's and- still going strong. Uh, you know, there's um, 
different choices that people have and we really appreciate every time somebody chooses a, a bay plate it means so, it really means a lot to us every time we're very frugal around here as you can you can see from our offices we don't we don't splurge we're not extravagant nice offices. It's, it's, it's they're fine they they we try to strike a balance between conservation of resources and morale of employees so we want things to be nice but at the same time every dollar that we spend on something that's not a grant is a dollar get, that doesn't go to a kid going on a field trip. Right. So. You don't have an elaborate office on the water anywhere or anything like that. Well, <laughs> we, would, we would love one if somebody wants to <laughs> donate. <laughs> Anyone listening wants to donate a beautiful office space on the water, we'll take it. But we're not going to spend our money on it. <laughs> All right. So I'm the only native Marylander here. And, uh, but I've lived in a bunch of places. And every place in which I've lived, they said, this is unique. There's no place like this. There's nothing like that. But with the Chesapeake, I think we're really in that situation where it is kind of like that. There's very few estuaries. I think we're the largest estuary in North America, mm-hmm. I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, But I think that brings with it um, a series of problems that a lot of other places don't have. Like you think about, like, you know, even with the crabs, if you go down to North Carolina or you go to maybe not Virginia, but, uh, you know, anywhere along the Atlantic coast, they, they can stack them up in piles, but no one eats them like we do here. They don't have that affinity well, for it. Let, let's define that. I mean, I mean, you, you talked about the largest estuary in the in the country, I think, second in the world, right? Yeah. I mean, it depends on what one defines. Isn't like the Bay of Bengal the largest in the world or something? The one thing that's really unique about ours, and we are orders of magnitude more than anyone else, is the size of the watershed compared to how much water we have in the bay. That that, that was what I was getting at, because I was coming back from Asheville um, back in December, and I remember I was in North Carolina, I believe, and it may have even been southernmost Virginia, but it was now entering the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Mm-hmm. And it was I don't in Virginia, we, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we weren't I, I want to think it was North Carolina, but I we weren't real close to the coast. And it was it was just amazing. I mean, obviously I know that the Sus- Susquehanna felt, you know, flows into it up on the north side, but uh where does the watershed you know come start? Yeah. I <laughs> so- mean Cooperstown, New York. So we actually have a little piece of New York that's Ah, in our watershed. Well, hold on there. So there's two uh, sources of the Susquehanna. And I know this because um, I went to St. Francis College, St. Francis University in Western Maryland. Uh And I was looking. I'm a Wikipedia nerd because I don't have a life. And I was looking at the source of the Susquehanna the other day. And one is Cooperstown, New York. That's the west. That's the eastern branch. But the western branch goes all the way to Loretto, Pennsylvania, which is the home of St. Francis, my alma mater. Oh, which that's seriously, great. So you're at the start of the watershed. Which, no, but hold on. Here's the size of this room, like mm-hmm. the, that, that town. It's Loretto. It's, it's tiny. And I found the spring where, like, it's in the middle of the woods right off campus. And it's it's literally uh, like uh, this spring that just bubbles up you, it barely. And it's 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 like the size of two fingers. That is and very it, cool right, to and see. And that, that's, that's the, that's that's the, the start of the bay. Of the yeah. bay that's you know? the start yeah. of the bay. That's bizarre. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I actually went there over the summer and found it. I poked through the woods until I found it. That's very cool. Yeah. Well, you know, we have sort of lots of places where there's headwaters that really could be considered one of the original sources of the bay. Because if you think about water's coming up out of the springs or right. rain is coming down and it's getting funneled from really far away places, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, out in West Virginia, Delaware. So the edges of our watershed, basically any water that's coming around the edges of our watershed is sort of the start where it starts feeding in. It's like big basins. Think of it as, you know, a bunch of Take the country and divide it into a bunch of bowls, you know, mm-hmm. and the bays are at the bottom of the bowl and the edges are like the top of the bowl where when rain is falling, it, it's going to go downhill. So we, our Chesapeake Basin is just really big and our bay is really shallow. I don't know if you guys are boaters. Mm-hmm. A lot of our audience today is probably boaters. I think I don't, the average depth is like eight feet. Yeah. So, you know, I find it all the time. Yeah, I, I <laughs> run aground pretty much every time I go sailing. It's not it's very forgiving. a big it's endorsement. All my, it's not like, That's it's right. like not New England. So this is like a starter bay. Exactly. Starter boating. Exactly. I yeah, know. I, I had often heard that without the channel, you could... 82 you know, feet. You, you come close to walking across the bay without... <laughs> yeah. It's it's real. Well, so it was, it was created by... Uh, a meteorite strike, like something like um, two, three million years ago, which is why if you have a well, you're familiar with the water system and the salt is because the water content is so high in iron because that's what a meteorite is. It's iron. So we're a flooded ri- river valley because of that. Yeah. So that's what that's that what sounds like a cons- conspiracy theory to me. Mm. <laughs> it's part. It's definitely part of the story. The meteorite. I think that is a definitely cool part of the story. It created a huge basin. Right. Um, a, you know, a, a hole, basically. This, you know, back in the ice age, when all the water was locked up in ice caps, 
the Susquehanna River really cut through, and it was the channel. What we know now is the channel of the Chesapeake Bay. Because it, it, it never came down here. The, uh, the, the uh, glacier never got this far down. It never came this far south, but a lot of the water in the whole on the planet was locked up in glaciers and ice caps. And as a result, think about it. You know, the whole South River was dry, right? Probably. I'm trying to think of the average depth of South, South River 21 – or the – the, the deepest point is probably 20 feet or 30 feet or something in the South River. But when you suck all the water out of the system and you send it to the ice caps, you're left with just the channel. And that's what this area looked like, you know, during the last ice age. It was just – it was a river. It was the Susquehanna River that basically flowed where it flows now, but then through the, the deep channel that we know now. And we really didn't have a bay. And then as the water kept – continued to melt from the ice caps, it filled the region and flooded the valley. And that's what we have today. So a big problem with the, the basin is it, it feeds a huge bay. When, I mean, it is a massive bay, but the problem is it carries all the, the pollutants and all the nutrients along with that. So that, that seems to be the issue. So if you look at the other states that are part of uh, in the bay watershed, I, and I kind of get it. I think the problem with that I see with the education part is getting all the other states on board with, with uh, protecting the bay. They really, it's not that they don't care. It's just that it's such an abstract concept to them that, you know, if you're in upstate New York or if you're in... Uh, you know, uh, northern, uh, northern or, or, or northwestern Pennsylvania, for you, it's... Th- right. This is why we have to change the conversation. We have to make it about local resources. People care about things they visit, certainly, but people care about where they live. And we view ourselves, our name may be Chesapeake Bay Trust, and of course we care about the main stem, the actual water in the Chesapeake Bay, but we care about all the communities around the, the watershed, around the system. So we make grants with partner dollars, not the, the Bay Plate or tax check off dollars, in Pennsylvania. So we want to reach the person in Lancaster County, the farmer who is um, probably not going to visit the Bay anytime soon. They're still part of the Bay watershed, and they still have local resources that help their lives. Now, what might, what might you grant to a farmer in Lancaster County? So a stream, Rain barrels or, yeah, or sure. a project or something along those yeah. lines? Um, stream bank uh, uh, stabilization, uh, forest buffer, that kind of project. Um, we have a number of projects right now as part of what we call our capacity building program, where we want to get organizations to be strong and solid and able to exist into the future. And we make some of those grants in Pennsylvania. We fund K through 12 environmental education right. projects in Pennsylvania. We want kids and to get outside. Absolutely. So we don't care where the, the student lives in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We want the student to get outside because if the student starts caring about natural resources in his or her local community, the environment in the whole region is going to get better. So it was it- interesting. I was reading an article the other day. Uh, it was something online. I was just I was on hold and I was just killing some time. And someone was talking. It was an article about kids raising kids and everything. And that generational bias you have that you know when we were kids we did this and kids don't do that anymore. And, and a lot of it's nonsense. But one one said if you have kids keep them keep them in rhythm with with the nature around them. Like what, what they were saying is that you know like for example my kids know when the ospreys leave that that falls coming and they look forward to them coming back every St. Patrick's Day. Mm-hmm. They understand what the tides do. They understand, you know, the geese coming. You know, these were and I grew up over in Montgomery County, which was not there was not a lot of nature. It was a very urbanized area. And here you can be in downtown Annapolis like we are right now, which is very urbanized, but in literally six, seven minutes you can be on any number one of waterfront communities and be part of that. You know, so so, so for me it was Education and you see the schools around here is I think they do have started at least to make an effort to connect kids to nature and to the rhythms of nature. Right. And, and it's hard in an urban area. Although, well, you know, I, I think they should teach gardening in school. I really think there should be a class on gardening. We right? agree. We fund a ton of K-12 schoolyard habitat projects in well, I think schools. You did, I think you did one for Central Elementary when my daughter was mm-hmm. there. They did a big rain barrel thing in a garden yeah. out there. with um, Outdoor classrooms are one of the big things yeah. that we do. And nature play spaces is another big thing that we fund. We really want, like, uh, nursery schools, pre-K, we would love to engage uh, them in building nature play spaces. The more connection you can get the outdoors, the better. And there's, there are now a lot of studies that show a connection to human health. It is literally healthy to get your kids outside, and that's what we should be trying to do. Sort of, sort of along that line. Okay, you're you're the one that's handing out the money, but say if you had twelve kids, 
Uh, and where, where, what organizations, what places would you go to, or tell them to go to learn about the Bay and ecology and saving this? I mean, obviously, I know we've got like in town, we've got the Annapolis Maritime Museum. Uh, what, what other places are good resources, I guess, for the kids to get involved? Oh my gosh, there's so many. And I hate to list them because I'm going to leave I'll some off. Couple, and it's couple, like choosing your favorite kids. <laughs> but, um, Patrick, Patrick's my favorite right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> there are so no, many – No question. <laughs> there's so many amazing organizations. So, you know, in this region, we have Chesapeake Bay Ecology Center, which is right across the, the Bay Bridge, if you want to take your kids on, a, you know, a, a, a experience that's sort of organized. What is that? I, I don't know that one. It's in Graysonville, right across the I had no idea. Bridge. Is that yes, one that is you're going out there on the left? It's uh, – as the... you're heading out from here on Route 50, heading east, it would be on the right. See, okay. That's not – see, I didn't never knew that was there. Yeah. See, this is, this is, this is what we're – this yeah. is awesome. I mean, okay. I'm choosing things that are not in the category. You know, we have the Maritime Museum here. There's, um, right. uh, oh, there's so many organizations. Right. Arlington Echo, Chesapeake Camp Chesapeake Let's. Museum you know, and, Chesapeake and Children's Museum. Chesapeake Children's Museum. There's so many yeah. wonderful. And I'm sorry for those grantees of ours that I left off the list. But... This is like the Oscars. <laughs> She's all panicked. <laughs> what, She's what, whipping out forget a, somebody. a sheet of paper with names on it. <laughs> um, but I, I guess the one thing I would like to, you know, point out to people is you don't have to be associated with an organization to take your kids outside on a great walk. There's so many wonderful uh, waterfront parks here. Just take your kids outside on a walk in the woods. You know, there's trails behind the Annapolis High School. There's trails behind South River High School. Yeah, what was Chris telling us? About? Chris Trump Bauer. He was telling us about uh, you guys. Bacon Ridge. Book. Yeah, I kept nodding like I, I knew what you're talking beautiful. about. And I had no idea. So, yeah. yeah. There's Greenberry Point. You can Bacon, drive yeah, up any day. Yeah, we've been at Greenberry Point. Yep. Um, um, to show how stupid people are in the world, I took pictures of the towers there and said that Teresa and I had gone to Paris. And people were like, oh, my gosh, that's so great. That's so cool. We just moved here. And, and it was like, no, they're like radio towers. They're not. <laughs> on a not Sunday the morning, there was this huge explosion <laughs> when they brought two of them down. They All right. They shook our whole house. Because it used to be five. Oh, yeah. The other, well, the other huh. one, I, I you know like, they ran. They ran D Day out of those towers. Yes, they, they D Day was all, coordinated. All, all the, You're kidding? Yeah. No, I did not know that. Gonna, like, when they had like <laughs> seven, something better than that. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, they ran the whole D Day invasion was run out of those towers. And for the wow. longest time, they used to. That was the one that communicated with all the nuclear subs. Oh, those yeah. towers. See, it has um, a great connection to D-Day. That's incredible. I mean, one, one of my cool, my, my favorite parks is around the corner, and I've just started going through it that the uh, Annapolis Maritime Museum took over, but the Ellen Moyer Back Creek mm-hmm. Nature Preserve. It's got yeah. some long name that the city has, but it's right there on It's neglected the, there for a little bit, but I think uh, they've, they've made some improvements. Yeah. They, I mean, it's, it's real yeah. nice. It's through the woods. You can get down there. There's Truxton a, ca- there's a Park. kayak launch. Mm-hmm. There's... Um, you know, there's, there's there's some pavilions and whatnot. And Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. They're all popping in. Oh, my that's head a now. really good yeah. one. We I went there um, w- once. They had they have they do something in May. It's like some. It's huge, their uh, community day. Yeah, yeah, and it's really cool because it's a sprawlingly huge um, complex. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. You know that, and the, you know, John was scolding me for not being a or that I should be a tourist in my own town and. I love that concept. Well, yeah, but I we mean, have amazing. You know, people do criticize Anne Arundel County for not having a lot of public access. For example, there's not a lot of public boat ramps right. here, but there are wonderful places to explore. Um, you know, and if you're thinking of like a low cost, no activity, no cost, no co- cost activity with your family, mm-hmm. going on a hour long walk in one of these places, it's you know, it really is. It's good for your health and it's good for the soul. You know, we just have incredible resources here. Even Thomas Point, you go there, it, I mean, you, it's impossible to park. I mean, because I think they can fit like five cars and you have to pay a parking. Like, so I don't know how people get there, but they have some great paths through the woods there. That, that's mm-hmm. just amazing. Yeah. You look, you look for them, they're there. The resources are definitely there in Anne Arundel County and actually all throughout Maryland. I mean, I know Patapsco State Park is really mm-hmm. um, a beautiful one there. What's there. comparable to, to Chesapeake? What would be like sister areas that, that's a lot like this? I, well, so I, as you mentioned, you know, some of us aren't native Marylanders. I try not to remember that. I've been here a very long I time. I, I, I left and I came back. I felt superior to both of you right there. The Chesapeake Bay is unique. There really is nothing else like it in my opinion, in the world. So so that said, I will, the, some of the comparable kinds of systems are like Puget Sound, right, mm-hmm. for us. Um, it's beautiful. Puget Sound is gorgeous, but it's nothing to me like, you know, the soul of the Chesapeake. We just – the culture here, the, the history, the ecosystem, the marshes, you know, when you picture yourself kind of, you know, like out in a marsh with nothing you can see in any direction but wetlands, I mean, it's just – it's there's nothing else like it. I don't think it's gorgeous. Well, I've met I've met some of the people that actually work the bay. I mean, have you seen Jay Fleming's book, Working the Bay? I mean, mm-hmm. it's just a great a great pictorial book. I gave it to my father for Christmas, and he loves it. And um, but it's uh, the flavors of the bay, the watermen, the and we're going to be talking to one soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying to nail down some dates that has been around for 
ever. Um, and just the bounty of the bay, and, and and you really do see why we need to protect it, why we need to do what we can. Plus, it's so accessible. I mean, that's the one thing. Like, you'll talk about the Puget Sound or, or any area. Well, I'd say maybe like around Charleston, South Carolina. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a little bit similar with the kind of the marshes. And, mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's, you know, my kids can fish. They can, they can crab. They can do all the things that when I was growing up. You know, we, I grew up 30 miles from here and you didn't have that accessibility. We had the right. Potomac and the Potomac was just an open sewer at the time. Right. Getting I, better? Well, yeah, no, it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a zillion times better. Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, it was just an open sewer and, and um, mm-hmm. now it's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And there's the bay, so many creeks though. For I mean, I, I don't want people from Montgomery County, for example, to feel like they're not connected. There's so many little creeks. There's, you know, Paint Branch and Muddy Rock, Branch Rock Creek. and Rock Creek. Rocky Park is phenomenal. Yeah, and there's beautiful places everywhere in our, in our region for kids. Everyone, so the, the statistics I always think about is everybody lives within a couple miles of a stream. Everybody, everybody in our watershed. So nothing is that far away. You're connected really closely with a, a water body. We lived in New Mexico for a while before we moved here. And Maybe not in New Mexico. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. Is that I, we loved it there and it was fantastic, but there was absolutely no – I think the Rio Grande came through, which was just this muddy creek by the time it got through Albuquerque, but mm-hmm. there was no water – Anywhere, and you just felt so isolated from that. And it's weird. As much as we loved it, you just feel like when you're on the East Coast or probably West Coast, well, anywhere but the desert, right. you have that that connection. That everything is, um, you know, you can you can come across like the Potomac's a perfect example. When I drive uh, to drive up to Western PA once a week, and you're driving along the Potomac, and it's this, you know, I'm used to it being in DC, just this huge roaring river. But you get up north like that and it gets tiny you know yeah. where, where you get to some parts you can jump across it you forget that right so you, you can be out in the air in in uh, parts of pennsylvania or western maryland or whatever and there's and i'm thinking the Pata- or not the patapsco is it patapsco no the um patuxent yeah patuxent goes on forever oh, so pretty the you know, is such you, pretty that river. goes that goes all the way jeez i mean that that goes into montgomery county i think and even even further i think it may even to washington county patuxent or the potomac patuxent Okay. And that's it. But, um, these, t- <laughs> they're both looking at me. It's true. Because <laughs> I'll get on, I'll get on uh, Google Maps sometimes. I, again, I don't have a life. And I'll, like, I'll find a river and then just start tracing it through Google Maps. And Next go, thing you know, you're in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's how it is. It's what like, are you wow. doing, honey? Just tracing a river. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I have to lie. I'm like, I'm looking at porn. She's like, oh, you're tracing rivers again. <laughs> no, 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 it's porn. But it's, uh, it's embarrassing. Yeah. Saying that out loud, it's a little embarrassing. No, no, no. Yeah. I, well, you know, we're river people here. We think yeah. it's great. Um, river how, how did the um I'm talk, talking about the rivers? I mean, I know we've got like the South River Keeper, the Western Road River Keeper, which Chris Trumbauer was right. before he uh, came, got all famous and got political and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. And then you've got um, is it Ed Kelly? That's Fred the, Kelly. Fred Kelly. Seven River Keeper. Um, on, on the Seven River. I mean, how important are He's these? Ri- one, Fred. Are the river keepers to? sort of helping that whole ecosystem with the bay and everything oh, else. they're and huge. Everything. And watershed organizations in general mm-hmm. in our neck of the woods are more powerful and more numerous than anywhere else in the country. We have a, a wonderful network of watershed organizations across the whole state that other states are envious of, um, more than Virginia. So um, it's, it's what keeps the public, I think, connected to the resource. They're a voice. They're an education arm. Some of them can be the advocacy groups. We don't fund the advocacy part. We can't, but we fund the sort of public education and the on the ground restoration work that they do. And for us, they're sort of our bread and butter grantees. So, you know, we look up to them because they do such great work and they're such hard workers. And we wouldn't have improving water quality without them. I don't think. Now, now, do you grant to them as well? Yes. Yeah. For okay. South River Federation gets lots of grants from us every year. So, to, uh, Seven River Keeper has uh, lots in the past. Magathy River Association, West Road River Keeper has been great. Is there a river in the area? I mean, I mean, in the immediate area. I mean, we've got the going, I guess, north to south. I mean, you've got the Susquehanna, mm-hmm. the Patapsco. Is that the next major river that comes down here? No, there's there's like the Bush River and the Bird River. There's That's tons right. of rivers in between. Um, I, I mean, do all of them have they don't, river keeper or that type of a? Yeah, that's a good question. They don't all have a watershed organization or a river keeper, but many of them do. And um, Blue Water Baltimore, for example, is a great example of Baltimore City where there used to be four groups. Um, and they realized they'd have a lot more power if they combined. And they did. And now they have a ton of power. Um, and, you know, reach, not just power, but reach and and uh, education value. So sure, sure. Impact and everything the else. The Eastern Shore has lots of them as well. Okay. Yeah. So, 
when you have, you're giving money out for for the um, education and for um, most of that tends to be for education on the bay itself, you know. But there's a lot of there's a lot of history to the bay that people forget about. That that's really uh, interesting. For example, I didn't know a whole lot about it. I listened to a lot of podcasts, and one was like stuff you should know or stuff you missed in history class. And they talked about the oyster wars, uh, oysterman wars, or I guess oyster wars in the early 1900s, where you had um, watermen from from Virginia and Maryland were having open firefights on the water over oyster beds. Yeah. Um, you know, the, during the uh, 1700s, the, the, the Chesapeake Bay was just swamped with pirates, you know, including Blackbeard. He, he would, he'd come up from the Caribbean and they would, they would ply the waters here. But there's just a ton of history that I just, that I think has kind of, you'd have to be a tremendous buff, but a, that seems to be a part of treasuring the bay is understanding the history, not just the ecology and, and the science. But I feel like that's something that they should really be teaching in schools or there should be um, some sort of resource for that because I, I don't see a whole lot of that. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, John Smith, of course, the story of John yeah. Smith here and uh, Chesapeake Conservancy is a group that's based here locally um, in Annapolis. That are in Eastport, right? Mm-hmm. And, and uh, we were talking about this before we started rolling, but Michener's um, Chesapeake is just, I, I read that probably every couple of years. Yeah. That's just an amazing that. book. I know. Mm-hmm. It just kind of connects you to like what it, what it must have been like here back in those times. For example, this is – and there's probably a historian out there who will be screaming at their iPhone right now. But if you look at uh, Ken Island, and on the southern tip of Ken Island is Bloody Point. Do you know why they call that Bloody Point? There was an Indian massacre, wasn't there? No, it was because there was a – after – during the slave trade, they stopped the slave trade. Um, I think it was before, it might have been right before the American Revolution because they, they stopped importing, the, Brit, the Brits got out of the slave trade. So they stopped it. So you'd have smugglers bring, bringing in slaves from West Africa. and But you'd have the British Navy would be in the Narrows. Uh, mm. And that's where they would hide because they could fly out and find these revenuers and the smugglers. So when they saw the slave ship, the illegal slave ships coming up, they would... Um, they would fly out, and then so the the slavers would then dump the the, the human cargo they had in the water. Mm-hmm. Then they were all chained, so they, that got to be called Bloody Point because that's the point where that's where the Navy hid. So that's where it always took place. Mm-hmm. It's pretty macabre. It is macabre, <laughs> yeah. But I think that the, the bay is full of stories like that. Mm-hmm. You know that it's it's um, it's really amazing. And like I said, I think we get the ecology and everything, and, and we're getting doing a great job with the kids getting right. them to understand that. But there really is a history that I think is starting to kind well, of just, disappear. Yeah, I mean, the Underground Railroad had a huge sure. route right up the Eastern Shore. And the Harriet Tubman Museum is now um, built center um, down in Blackwater. Gorgeous place that people should go visit. So, yeah, there's there's lots of connections of different cultures and different peoples to the natural resources. All right. Absolutely. I'll tell you, I, can I get a – I want to get a drink of water here real quick. You think you'd start bringing water to these Yeah, well, things. I interrupt it and run it back. Let's take, take a quick I'm break. I'm starting to think that you just do that so we could take a break. We could do that. But um, when we get back, we'll talk uh, – I know you said you're not a political organization per se, but I think so I want to talk – let's get into politics. politics. <laughs> let's talk politics a little bit. We'll be right back. Spring is here, and baseball season is here. Is your lawn ready for a game of catch or batting practice with the kids? Turn to the lawn and garden experts at Homestead Gardens and learn what products they recommend for a healthy green lawn. Homestead Gardens carries the widest selection of natural and organic garden solutions for a kid, pet, and environmentally safe lawn. Because lawns aren't just for looking at, they're for playing in. Visit homesteadgardens.com for weekly deals, inspiration, and more. Live life outdoors this season with Homestead Gardens, Davidsonville, and Severna Park. When you file your Maryland tax return this year, please support the Chesapeake Bay Trust by contributing to the Chesapeake Bay and Endangered Species Fund. It's tax deductible. I'm Peter Franchot, Maryland Comptroller, and I support the fund. Learn more at cbtrust.org. If you don't like huge draft beer selections, don't go to Union Jacks. If you're not looking for an incredible menu and dozens of screens to catch your favorite teams, I repeat, do not go to Union Jacks. Not into darts and pool? Good. Live music not your thing? Perfect. Bottom line, if you are not interested in the best dining and bar experience in Annapolis, avoid Union Jacks. But if this all sounds totally friggin' awesome to you, visit Union Jacks in Annapolis, just across from Whole Foods in the Annapolis Town Center. Union Jacks, not your old-style pub. And we're back. That was a good glass of water. Uh, thank you for the interruption. And now you're going to need a bathroom break in another 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, that's it. But before we left, uh, we were just talking, I mean, the, I know you're not into, into the politics, but I know that just today, and this will air next week, but the state legislature is looking into a bill to prevent the hunting or the sport fishing, I guess, of the rays. And we saw a lot of outrage last year uh, when there were some hunters out there uh, harpooning I guess they were harpooning the rays in the Potomac. I think it's a bow and arrow, isn't it? 
Yeah, I think you're right. I think yeah. I'm picturing like these. Yeah, Ahab with the with the harp. Exactly. Har- <laughs> throw, throwing harpoons. Um, with the rays uh, breaching the water. <laughs> I, I mean, over. swallowing boats. <laughs> I mean, on one hand, it's 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 that great point, news right. that the the bay is healthy enough to be able to support animals that arguably could be thinned out or hunted. I mean, I know when we have you know deer populations, they they thin those herds out a little bit, uh, and it's kind of exciting to hear that the bay has been doing good. Now we're. Well, I think the difference with that, though, is that the, the, the deer are not really an integral part of the, the food chain, at least in the level where we are, right? Right in a suburban area. I don't, I wouldn't think. Whereas when I was a kid, so it was back in probably 84, 85, they, that was when they put the moratorium for a few years on rockfish, complete moratorium. And, um, it, it was wildly successful. However, there were dips after that in crab populations and then, you know, seagrass pop, you know, so even if you're doing something that's supposed to be good, uh, you you have this chain reaction that goes right up the food chain that can alter everything. So I yeah. think that's what it is. It's like that little puzzle with a missing piece in it that you keep moving everything around. Right. Everything it, is connected. You know, we call them food webs on, on intentionally because connections are in di- all different directions. You know, you picture in fourth grade science class and you learned about the food web. You know, there's species at every little node. I'm doing node. a project right now. My son's peripherally involved in that too. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, when you alter one species – um, and you do it intentionally as a human, kind of, sort of, one could argue, outside this food chain, you you could have unintended cons- consequences all over the food chain. So Someone was talking about that. There was an article, I was reading a pretty good article the other day, where they they, they found usable DNA uh, somewhere, like north of Siberia or somewhere in Alaska, usable uh, DNA from, from preserved skin that was flash frozen of um, a mammoth. And they're actually, uh, and it was not just, it's not a fringe site. It was a Smithsonian, it was like smithsonian.com. And they're talking about the ability to clone it, which they think they could do it. You know, they, they, they incubate it in an African elephant. And, but now you're to the, uh, to the question of should they do it? I mean, it's, that is such an interesting it's question. It's a fascinating thing. And I, yeah. I, and I go back to, like you said, you have unintended consequences for, you know, if, if you, if, you, there might be something that you do if you overfit. For example, if you you take too many oysters out of the bay, which we have, you have uh, an effect that that it that they don't filter the bay. And I think you know one oyster filters like eight gallons a day or something like that. But so you see adverse consequences to that. And so you know that you know if we can restore the oysters, it's going to have a, a positive effect on the bay and everything that lives within that. However, what is the the consequences of of giving a, a species a boost that maybe you know for example I'm looking at these tundra swans that everyone in my neighborhood loves they they love these swans that they they come back every winter but they're incredibly destructive to to the bay you know they they eat the sea grasses uh, or the bay grasses and which you know is a hiding place for the crabs but I mean you all of a sudden you're playing god with a, with a lot of species and I don't under he, I guess you have to figure out. What works and what doesn't, you know, right. not so, just what to save, but what to, is it a danger in saving some? Exactly. I don't, some of these questions I think don't have right or wrong answers. So for example, the oyster populations are down at 1% of their historic levels. We all agree. It's not a controversial statement to say that's a problem. And we, the Chesapeake Bay Trust is involved in trying to bring those populations back up. And lots of people are, right? Um, we are comfortable saying that because it's a human problem, more or less, that drove the populations down. But we're now saying some alterations of species numbers are okay, right? We all agree that we're going to try to increase the number of oysters. When is it not okay to change the population size intentionally of a species? Some argue that, you know, uh, you know, removing the cow nose ray is not a good thing, uh, because that's not an acceptable alteration. So I think that these questions can be philosophical and sometimes there isn't a right or wrong answer. And how we feel at the trust is you have to base it on the best available science. But why do we seem to have such an issue in the Chesapeake Bay? And we have for as long as I've been alive is that, you know, it's, it, it, you mentioned in our break there that this, for the first time in, in years, we've had two years of, of positive health, uh, health marks for the Stand bay. Stand innovation for the healthy <laughs> bay for two years. But that said, so we talk about how unique the Chesapeake is and we say that with a sense of pride, but we say it with a sense of, of dread too, because we talked about the Puget Sound. We'll talk about like, you know, the saltwater flats of New Jersey or those in the Carolinas. And those seem to be thriving. You know, they have uh, po- huge oyster populations. They have huge crab populations. Uh, the Puget Sound doesn't, but I mean, right. so why, why do we, and they have farming. They have the same, mm-hmm. they have urbanization. They have the same issues that we have, 
why does the bay seem to have so many problems when compared to other waterways? Right. A lot of it gets back to the uniqueness. And we talked a little bit um, at one point about the size of our watershed compared to the volume of water in it. And we never quite finished that thought. But the, the ramification of that is that the, the ratio of stuff we do on the land to the impact on a gallon of water in the bay is much larger than any other watershed because we have that many more people it's just that big. impacting it per volume of water. How many people are in the watershed? I thought it was like 30 million or something like yes, that. Yes, that's one stat. How many? The- like 30 million. Wow. Yeah. I mean, well, think, well, think we of have DC- 6 million people in Maryland, right? Right. We can do the math. <laughs> right. And then, but yeah, where, where's the watershed Washington. end on the west? Is so it on it's the- part of New York, a good chunk of Pennsylvania, the middle chunk of Pennsylvania, a good chunk of West Virginia, like the right-hand side, the eastern side of West Virginia, most of Maryland, uh, a good chunk of Virginia, and a little piece of Delaware, and, and, and some, Washington, D.C. Right, and some Delaware, go, that goes in the Delaware Bay, mm-hmm. New Jersey and Del- yep. yeah, so, so Delaware, part of it goes to the Chesapeake Bay, part of it goes to Delaware Bay, and then part of it goes to the open ocean. Well, so, okay, so... Um, we were talking about the things that go into the bay. It's not just pollution, but I know uh, looking through some of the articles uh, that I was looking at the last couple of days, um, the uh, chicken manure, which is used as a fertilizer, so extremely high in nitrogen. Um, and, and phosphorus. And really. phosphorus, yeah. yeah. And, and I think just in Anne Arundel County, we just, I think you cannot put down, this was a new legislation either last year or the year before, mm-hmm. where you can't put down uh, uh Fertil- grass fertilizer. It's like November grass, through November through March. March. Yeah, you know, because of the phosphorus. And yeah. and you know, grass fertilizer is is pretty bad, you know, for, for what it is. But but with the farmers you have that, that push and pull where it's um I, I think, you know, we have a governor um who is very, very pro business. Um we have a president who's very, very pro business and both of them talk about unnecessary regulation and then you have to decide what is unnecessary. But you well know, the is that I think you kinda of get into that 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 mindset going look it's the, it sucks that we that, you know that we're harming the bay but you know jobs depend on this and we have farmers who depend on this and um you know i think that corn takes something like 200 pounds of fertilizer per acre something something ridiculous mm-hmm. um to because corn it's a tropical plant so it's it's it it needs a lot of nutrients and a lot of that flows into the bay yeah how do you how, that's a problem I mean, when you look at the farmers yeah. and trying to explain to them you know how they can't make a living or or how, how it's going to make it that much harder for them I understand a lot of the, the, the politicians, elected officials, that's a hard one for them to do. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we feel like agriculture is such a huge component of our system, uh, both economically and culturally and historically. And we want to see farms on the Eastern Shore, right? We all want to, and, and the Western Shore, sorry for Western Shore farmers. <laughs> um, but agriculture is a huge part of the fabric of our society and it needs to, it needs to stay. And I, you know, we know the math behind what's sort of, quote, wrong with the bay. We know the sources of where the ex- excess nutrients and sediment are coming from. We know it's from the stormwater sector. That's us, right? So um, it's me. I'm I am creating stormwater. I have a roof, and I You're don't – stop that. You're, you're really screwing up the bay. Just, <laughs> I am. We've been so... to talk to you about that. Well, you know, you, know it's, it's, it, you talked about screwing up the bay, and, and as I mentioned before we started this thing, I'm probably not – Doing as much as I can personally do. And we're going to talk to you about that. Just, yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's that hidden room with, like the, with, the, with the shackles and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I've often thought that it's very similar to um, recycling. Mm-hmm. When I was growing up, we never recycled. Everything was went in the trash can and we didn't really care where it went. Um, all of a sudden, it became a little bit more convenient. We didn't need – when it first came out, we had a green and brown and clear glass and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and now and it's just – And now you just put it in one bin. Right. Put it in one bin, paper, cans. It doesn't matter and somebody else does it. And, and it became very easy to do. And I think – you know, my personal thought is that you know, until – and I, I would hope that we would never hit rock bottom. But until the bay becomes unusable for people for recreation or a living um, – and. You know, as it becomes easier to be healthy for the bay, that's where you're really going to start to see the bay come from a, you know, a C grade or to a B grade to an A grade very quickly. Um, Absolutely. Because, because our, our, you know, face it, we're lazy. Yeah. I mean, just look at Tim. Yeah, I'm very lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, well, I didn't even we all have, we, uh. we all have priorities in our lives. And the, one of the types of work that we've been funding here is the sort of science behind social science, be, behind behavior change, the social science behind behavior change, I should say. So how do we get people to want to change their behavior? What barriers do they perceive in doing things that we consider, quote, the right That's thing? That's interesting. Mm-hmm. So in recycling is an example that people in the social science in this field talk about all the time. What is it? So th- there's a couple cool things that 
when you hear them, you're like, oh, of course. For example, the yellow bin. We use yellow bins. Some people use blue bins. But it's a social prompt. So you see it in your backyard and it reminds you every day, oh, I better recycle. And then the peer pressure is another major uh, piece of this whole behavior change world. Everybody on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, whatever, is putting out their yellow or blue bin and you see your neighbors do it and you think, oh my goodness, right. I have there, to, I have to do this too. There's that house that doesn't have There's one. There's the house that doesn't have but one. I feel like the recycling guys are kind of judging me. Exactly. Then you get the thing in the mail from the, your county that Same says, with, "There's a lot of beer cans." In right. There. We're doing X compared to others, you know. Or nowadays with our metering, you get the the notice from your uh, your electric company telling you exactly where you stand relative to your neighbors. Right. Right. That's all part of the social science be- behind how to get people to change their behaviors. And when you look at the sources, just going back to sort of the agriculture, I do feel like people sometimes blame the ag community. Look, the ag community produces our food. It's very important. But how do we get them to want? Give them, give them incentives. The same way we're going to give people in the stormwater sector, sector incentives. We have to think about a combination of incentives and education and just really understanding people's barriers to doing what we consider, quote, the right thing. So we went to, we go to Ireland every couple of years and they're very serious about recycling there, but it's very difficult. You got to drive your recycling to a recycling center somewhere outside town and it's not convenient. And then you have to separate, but mm-hmm. everyone there does it. So we were there for a week and at the end of the week, I looked in our trash can and we had, like re- literally left. one square, one bag. And this was probably 15 mm-hmm. years ago or whatever it was. And that's when it kind of hit me going, man, it couldn't be any easier for, for me. I throw it all in one bin. And even okay. then I'm kind of like, I don't want to go to the garage. That's like across the kitchen. I don't want to. So that kind of changed my mindset. But where it's, I think if they did something like, where, like to me, it became a challenge at that point. But if they did something like where they said, they could weigh it. They said, here's how much garbage, how many pounds of garbage your, your family produces a year. And here's how much recycling your family produces a year. And if they all of a sudden you got that chart like you do from BG&E, mm-hmm. like here's you, here's last year, here's your neighbors. Well, like, I think that's where competitive Absolutely. nature kind of yeah. kicks in. Yeah. But you don't see it. That's the problem is that you throw your recycling in the bin and it goes away. And I don't think you feel good about it. You don't feel it's just something you do now. I wish there was a way to connect you with mm-hmm. the results of what you're doing. And that, that's the hard yeah. part. With, something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, no, it really is. Mm-hmm. What are um, what are some of your the most awesomest pro? What's your most awesomest projects of 2016? Since we're in early 17 now, that you guys funded last most year. Most awesomest. Oh, we fund so many great projects. We make about 450 grants a year, and so what's it's, the average grant? The average grant size is uh, twenty two thousand dollars. Whoa. But we make grants as small as twenty five bucks. I think actually last year our smallest grant was maybe $250. that would to be your parking fund. Yes. <laughs> to the so city a teacher, Apple. for example, who just needs a few dollars to get his or her students Got outside it. to build a garden, um, to I think our largest grant I should know this, but it was a couple hundred thousand dollars um, for I think it was a wetland project, um, huge you know professional restoration wetland project. So we make lots of grants. We love them all. Um, some of my f- I won't say favorites, but some of the ones that we highlighted in our annual report, for example, we funded a a component of a native plant garden, a pollinator garden at Camden Yards. So anybody who goes to a baseball game, if you're going in. I've seen that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's great. You know, it's a a garden, so it replaces impervious surface, so it soaks water into the ground. I know the first, my first foray into the impervious surface problem was at a blackwall hitch. We when, funded um, the design of that parking lot, yeah. Right when they, when, oh yeah, that was a huge project. When they when they yeah. did that, and mm-hmm. that was uh, it's kind of neat because it has. I, I've been told it's a zero runoff property. Yeah, that was a Spot Creek Conservancy led project to the, treat uh, all the water. It's got the rain barrels. It's got the uh, overflow goes into the channel surrounding the parking mm-hmm. lot to water the flowers, mm-hmm. and then if it overflows or just the rain that hits. The parking lot goes. It's angled down into those concrete absorbent pads, which. Mm-hmm come back down. Um, Do you know I met the guy who invented the rain garden from University of Maryland? Oh, really? Yeah. Go ahead. Alan Davis. Yeah. yeah so I, I, where I used to work, I wrote this article and we, we had it in a magazine about rain gardens and he just wandered into my office one day. He goes, hey, could I have a few of those? He goes, uh, I, 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 I'm the one who made the rain garden. I thought he meant the rain garden on the cup. Mm-hmm. So I gave him a bunch of issues and, and uh, he, he gave yeah, me Prince, his name and he walked, I looked him up. He invented the rain garden. <laughs> Prince George's <laughs> County is credited nationwide, really worldwide as the sort of birthplace of low impact development. There were a number of people who worked at the county who were instrumental in this, so county staff coupled with folks from University of Maryland who kind of invented low impact development. So it's very cool. There's a, a nonprofit um, in Prince George's. You could, you could attack, well, I think, I think at least something in Arundel County where it's impossible to do anything. Like we live near the water; we're not on the water. The house in front of us is, but if we want to do anything, we can't because of the coverage and and, and you're um, in the critical area, right? So, um, 
But I think you can you can offset like if you were to build a shed, I think you could offset that by building a rain garden, which gives you like a certain percentage more of you know perkability. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But There's I think lots you, of counties you get a tax that give tax too. credits for uh, yeah for in- installing kind of best management practices. We call them. On See, the and that's that incentive we're talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, is that you, you can say you can build here's how to build a rain garden, and you know you can feel good about yourself. But how long does that last? We said all right, build. A, there's a practical side to it, which is you you get a tax. You can, re- re- you can rearrange their priority. Exactly, right. Mm-hmm. To be able to do that. That's, that's that's what I love about rain barrels. They're kind of complicated to put in, relatively speaking, um, compared to like planting a tree. But then you have water to water your garden and it saves your water bill. There's a great place in Eastport that does like the wooden ones because the plastic ones I'm not a big fan of. But he, whoever it is, that they, they do these. Oh, that's the one. Barrels. That's the place I serve across from the post office. Yeah, they do. They, um, but those, speak Avenue. those are beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as far as for, I want to go back to your grants, as far as I mean, could a neighborhood community apply? Absolutely, a, bo- love- a, a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout troop. We did. Uh, yep. Run on the Bay did. We yeah, did a very you guys big project. Been a grantees of ours several times. Yeah, it was a big project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was amazing what they did. And I think I, I'm trying to remember. I think um, you did. We did it in partnership with a few people. We had mm-hmm. a federal grant element to it, yeah. but we built this huge channel that just took water down. We had flooding problems, and now we don't have flooding mm-hmm. problems. But it's and it looks beautiful too. Mm-hmm. Great. Who else? I, I hate to use the word competition because you guys are all working. You're all in cahoots together. But who else is? Is there anybody else giving grants? I mean, obviously you're the primary grant giver. I mean, but uh, the Bay Foundation, I'm assuming, gives out some grants. But I mean, they do more. Yeah, they don't. I don't think the Chesapeake Bay Foundation gives out grants. No. Um, ironically, our names are, should be perhaps, you know, re- reorganized a little bit. But there are other funders in the space. Um, uh, Keith Campbell Foundation is an environmental foundation that's based in Eastport. And lots of our grantees get grants from them as mm-hmm. well. There are national uh, funders who give out grants for similar kinds of projects as well, okay. national level. That, and how do they raise their um, money? Uh, so in one example is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. They get federal money from the EPA that they administer as grants. Um, and there are groups in our, na- in our, in our neck of the woods who get grants from them as well. Unity Gardens, um, uh, has been active in giving out small grants for, or on spot. Yep. They're based in, uh, in Eastport, um, as well. Do um, they do the, uh, meditation? The, yeah. Yeah. That's the, one. the, 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 the labyrinthy kind of things. Yep. So there, are, there are, um, I won't say lots of other potential funding organizations, but, um, you know, folks who want to apply for one of our grants want information about how to kind of leverage those dollars and, and, um, do a, a larger project. We'd be happy to speak with them. Do you so have- do we, pitch, do we pitch a grant to you? Is that how? So we have open calls for proposals every year. Um, and there's no restrictions on it. I mean, you'll, you'll evaluate each of them, any of them? Yeah. Some, I mean, some of them do have restrictions, but we lay it all out in each of the, the documents, which we call requests for proposals. And they're all on our website. And so it'll lay out a, an eligibility section. So it'll tell you what kind of organizations can apply, faith-based organizations, homeowners associations, you know, nonprofit groups, Youth, schools. Right, right. Um, but sometimes uh, local governments can apply. Sometimes uh, there will be a restriction, like um, some of our grant programs will only fund in Maryland. Some of them are open a larger scale. Sometimes we'll partner with a county. And so you have to be a county um, organization to apply. Okay. And all this you said is on the website, and that's mm-hmm. baytrust.org? Cbtrust.org. Cbtrust.org. Mm-hmm. So I something. screwed that up. <laughs> You just ruined the podcast, John. That's okay. So we have won't uh, be the first time. I've been. Uh, I was on a, a community foundation once with that, that would distribute funds, and what I noticed is that you had the same people who did great work. They were the same ones who were applying, you know, over and over because they understood the paperwork, they understand the process. Do you see that a lot? Where you have a lot of people come back to the well. I mean, they do good work. Uh, right. Yeah. So. so we love our previous grantees, and we love new grantees. And actually, this year for the first time, we restructured one of our grant programs su- such that it's only eligible for new applicants right. because we want to get new groups in the groove and getting them to do projects. That, sure, you've got to expand right. the reach. You want you want the farmer, I guess, in Lancaster that doesn't know that it, that it's, that it's available. Right. And, it can and you be know, a we have to start speaking in the Bay community beyond the choir. We know that we right. will not get to where we want to be from a resource perspective if we don't start engaging other groups who right now don't consider themselves environment groups, faith-based organizations, you know, uh, health, human health-related organizations. Natural resources are really important to both of those groups. So in the family of conservation, mm-hmm. you, 
the, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is the obvious child. I mean, that, that's the one that's out there. They're, they're, they're the fun one. They're the party one, if you think about, right? <laughs> are we not the party group? <laughs> no, you are. I saw you guys were drinking when I came in. It's only like. But, <laughs> we so, were not, just, we were not doing party. that. For the record, we were not doing that. They're making grants in there. It's very serious. <laughs> they're lying. They're they lying. Open it up. <laughs> so, but, so is there a marketing element to what you do? Because if you look at what CBF do, the, 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 the marketing they have is basically for to understand that there is a need. The, 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 they're the ones who have the, the events. They're the ones that, that, that put out the press releases and but you guys are the are really the, the business end of it you know you're, you're the ones who are cranking out money and going through the the grants do you have do you have to get your name out there is there a marketing element to what do you do or we, you're, you're like you know we're well known enough people come to us to know that <laughs> the people are going to find the money right you, we, you don't have to advertise to no, get money we have a, i mean look our the main sources of our revenue are the tax checkoff which we've talked about and the bay plate and so we need people to understand the value of those two revenue streams and the fact that every single person that's listening to this podcast can donate a tax time and can buy a bay plate if he or she doesn't have one yet. What do you and get for a plate? The bay plate – okay. So the bay plate is a really cool thing, right? It's prettier for your car. Right. Uh, hands down, I'm I'm going to say that. Oh, um, right. Most people agree. Here, here's, here's a pro tip on the bay plates. Out-of-state cops, it confuses them. And they often write Connecticut down so you can get out of tickets. Oh, my goodness. That is not the official position of the Chesapeake Bay Trust. But I'll, so the, no such thing as bad marketing. <laughs> the other benefit is that it's 20 bucks, So you pay 20 bucks to get your Bay Plate. But we have a Plate Perks program. I like the Bay Plate Perks program. Yeah, Except so, it didn't work in the garage here today because the garage was full because of the stupid senators and delegates were taking up all the spots. But. Also not the official, official position of the trust. But <laughs> That's you, my official. You can make your $20 back in a couple months. There are tons of businesses, many of them around this area, that will give you a discount on services. Uh, Eastport Shell is one. Annapolis Smokehouse is one. There's parking. No places. Yeah. So you, yep. can, you can – I mean, if you go out to dinner at one of the participating – uh, plate perks restaurants four times you make your twenty dollars right, back. No, right Ram's away. Head participates. Yep, Ram's Head has parking. Um, I had no idea. The that Annapolis existed. City garages have usually four or five spots right up front by the entrances for yep. uh, Bay Plate holders. All the Ram's Head restaurants have when they when they have parkings, which right. is so that's like Shore House, Roadhouse, and whatnot. So has. if you're listening and you have a Bay Plate and you do not have your Plate Perks card, um, call us and we will give you one. Or you can go to bayplate.org and just look. There's an on- online place to, to sign get a up new card. for a Plate Perks card and the businesses are always changing we just had three new businesses be added today um so there's a constantly new perks being added so check out uh, bayplate.org and you can see the perks the company so, so you get you get perks mm-hmm. you get a cool looking plate yep one designed by a local artist yeah it goes to help the bay mm-hmm. and it might get you out of a ticket there's really no downside to having a bay plate <laughs> And the tax checkoff is coming up. Right? You know the thing I liked? I don't know who did this. It was uh, that symbol for local crab or Maryland crab that restaurants had. Mm-hmm. You know, True blue? Yeah. I think, is that still on? Is that still on? Sl- I love I've that. Heard, I've heard they're slowly fading that out because it was a little bit of a, uh, of a money suck as far as administering it. And a lot of the restaurants didn't get on board with it. I like that. And, and it turned out to be, and to be honest with you, I thought it was kind of an embarrassment when you look here in Annapolis and you go to the True Blue website and say that there's like three restaurants in Annapolis that serve True Blue crab. Well, that's what, that's what I felt about Philly. If you want to get crab, you know, as kind of a tourist, if you're leaving, if you're coming to visit Maryland, you get Phillips at the at, at BWI. And that is my official position. I think it's ridiculous <laughs> that Phillips is being sold as, as a Maryland crab. It's ridiculous. It's there from are lots Indonesia. of restaurants around here that do. Uh, our true Maryland crab. And yeah, and I, I made when they had that program. I actually did go to those restaurants for that reason. Right, uh, that's an incentive that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Do you get money on re- on uh, renewals of plates? Yeah, there is a it's a ten dollar fee a year to renew your plate. Okay, so you mm-hmm. so okay, so when you do renew your bay plate, you do get that. So my my initial payment continues to as I renew my license, right. as I renew my plate. Mm-hmm. What about and the farm license? You don't get anything for it? We work very closely with that group. They're called the Maryland Agricultural Agricultural Education Foundation. Are you we, kicking their butt? Um, we are partners and we <laughs> care about each other and they are a grantee of ours. You said there was no politics involved in this thing here. <laughs> this seems um, pretty political. No, but you know, they're a great organization as well and uh, you know, they're, I think both plates are beautiful and both organizations are Take the plate revenue, all of our revenue, really seriously. So for us, 92 cents of every dollar that comes in goes out um, applied to programs. So and that's both you and um, I don't actually know what MAPE's percentage is, but okay. um, we, you know, we talk all the time, and we every bay plate that's sold to us 
mean something. You know, if I have a ten dollar charge here, I say, oh my gosh, that's you know half a bay plate. So we take it seriously. <laughs> what was the, what was the percentage in bay you said we do? We don't do we don't use dollars as our currency. It's a beautiful dress, plates. I know. It's twenty Three bay, bay plates. plates. Yeah. yeah. What did you say your percentage was? It goes back out to the program. Ninety two cents. Ninety two cents. We are one of the most efficient charities in of the country. Every dollar. And there's a there's a. a Charity uh, evaluator called Charity Navigator. Right. We've been a four star Charity Navigator for a very, very long time. We have one of the highest ratings on uh, Charity Navigator. And there are four stars available. Uh, yes, I should say four out of four stars. <laughs> <laughs> you just make say, well, are there five? No, yeah, there are no, only four no, stars, so and we have ten. all of them. That's right. This looks really dismal. <laughs> so I'm going out on a limb. That Porsche that's in the garage here, that's not yours. <laughs> not ours. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think everybody needs to go to cbtrust.org. Um, learn a lot more about Chesapeake Bay Trust, about what they do. I mean, you guys are, I don't want to say the boots in the bay, but I mean, you, you're funding the boots in the bay. We, we, um, that's how we view ourselves. You're doing yeah. tangible work to get the bay up from a, what, what is this current grade? It's a C minus, which doesn't sound good, but no, this is better than a D, right? Right. That's true. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's moved up from a D mm-hmm. to a C minus for two years in a row, uh, as a result of a lot of the work that you've done and with the organizations that you've partnered with. CBTrust.org is where you can find that. When you go to DMV, make sure you get a bay plate. They're, they're, they're nice looking. Um, they were nicer looking when Maryland had the real ugly, more 18, 12 plates. Those are pretty hideous. Yeah. But, uh, um, the old line and, uh, and, and, the, and the perks and everything else are very nice, uh, yeah. to deal with as well. As you're filling out your taxes this year and next year and on forward, make sure you check box 35, right? 35? 35. 35. Uh, and, and donate a little bit. I mean, it's, uh, it goes to a much better cause than that stupid one on the federal return that says, you know, to the presidential election commission or whatever it is. I think it, you know, keep it a little bit local. Um, and, uh, and that's about, did we miss anything was what's, you know, what's, how do how do you run? You, you're a board. You've got a board. Yep. We have a, a board. Uh, most of them are appointed by the governor of the state of Maryland. We are, we were established by the state legislature. So, um, as a way to get money really to groups. On how the long have you been around as an organization? Uh, 31 years, okay. 19, 32, th- 1985. Hmm. Does the state fund you? We do not get a direct appropriation from the state. So every dollar that we bring in, we raise from the bait plate and the tax check off and other sources. Okay, so the electric bill comes due here in this office. You've got to have the. You've got to raise the money to pay for it. Yes. Yep. Yeah, hey, bake, Governor Hogan, how come you're not coughing some money over there? <laughs> Seriously, that's. Uh, I mean, with such a resource, you would think that that would be something that. And I, I, I get that. I mean. No matter how much you raise, no matter how much the CBF or any of the other organizations raise, um, it's not enough. I mean, we we need to do more. Well, I think you, I mean, as much money as you can raise is as much you can give it all away. I mean, there's just uh, I've seen the environmental concern for the bay. It's been that wailing and gnashing of teeth for years, and I think the last ten years you're seeing some really positive results. I mean, anecdotally, I mean, you can read into everything. I think one of the criticisms we talked about this with uh, Chris Trumpbauer. One of the criticisms in Chesapeake Bay Blues with the with the CBF from Dr. Ernst and his thing was that we would take minor victories and conflate them that there are major victories and then everyone had a false sense of security about the health of the bay. And I think that uh, that in the last ten years you've actually seen some movement. Um, you know, you're seeing that the seagrasses are coming back. Even even seeing dolphins and and as far up as uh, Thomas Point. The I mean, dolphins were kind of cool this year. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, they're definitely cool. Yeah, and you know, you can't say. I mean, that's another thing. Going, oh, we're getting healthier, and people say, well, no, it was just a fluke, maybe. Yeah. But I mean, I just. Living on the water, around the water, I mean, I'm seeing a pretty significant difference. I mean, yeah. There have been a lot of people working really, really hard on this for so many decades. And to me, it's it's incredible to see us turning the corner. And I really feel like we are. Now, look, uh, we're all science-based, so we'll see what happens with next summer and, and the you know reports that come out. But I really do feel like we finally – we know what the problem is. We know how to solve it. We know – sort of more or less how to pay for it. And we are committed to doing it. And we have such a huge population. 52% of people in Maryland say they want to work on improving the Bay. That's a huge number compared to other regions across the country in terms of people that care about their iconic natural resources. So well, take, we have all the ingredients and we are turning a corner. I'm confident. Well, for the 48% that haven't said they want to do something, what I and I've noticed over the years, much to the chagrin of a lot of boaters, uh, there's so many ways to get out on the Bay and to explore and to see really what 
you know, a natural beauty of this. I mean, we've got the stand up paddle boarding, you've got the kayaking. Uh, I don't have a boat anymore just because I realized somebody else's boat was a lot more <laughs> profitable to my, you know, a lot more beneficial to my kids' college tuition. But, uh, there's just so many ways to do it. I mean, the stand up paddle boarding is getting huge. I mean, there, there you've got some exercise and some fitness to tie in with that. And you can really, I mean, that's, you're at the waterline to see. Well, I'm interested in, we, we talk, we get that waterman in that we're talking to right now is just someone who's at ground level, you know, who, who can see, you know, because they make their living off the bay and they, for almost the scientific way is that they can measure the health of the bay essentially by how much money they're making by pulling things out of the bay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, anecdotally, when I moved here 20 years ago, we'd crab all the time. And in a weekend, we would have a few dozen keepers. And now we'll have pots in all week to get maybe eight or nine. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and it's improved lately. But I mean, and again, that's not a scientific. We have a lot of work but, to do. But I think um, I think that the ingredients, again, are there for us to, to get this done. I, I'm confident that we are going to make sure that, you know, our resources, all of it, rivers, streams, the bay come back to where we want them to be. All right. Well, like I told my kids when the report cards came out, you have, you have a C minus now. So when we talk to you next year. We want to be higher. We move to A. So yeah. we're going to hold we you to, to that. And then I'm going to tell you the same thing. If you get it to an A, you get an Xbox. <laughs> all right, well, let's, 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 let's throw a challenge out for, uh, for all of us as a homework. Get out on the bay. See what it's all about. Whether it's an estuary, whether it's a river, um, maybe it's a walk along a creek. Find out what it's all about. Uh, encourage if you're in school, if your kids are in school, encourage your school to get involved in some sort of a project, uh, some sort of an ecology project. Buy the bay plates, get out of traffic tickets. Not the official policy <laughs> of the Chesapeake Bay. I fucked my way out of tickets. And, um, you know, check the box 35 to cough up a couple bucks with your tax return and go to cbtrust.org and find out. Really, what they do is highlight their things. See if you can get involved with a uh, with a project. See if you can get involved. Um, if writing a check is easier for you, we accept them. Chesapeake Bay Trust <laughs> and what what the PO box or you can you can come actually you, if it's big enough they'll take you out to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and you can actually donate online. So with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the eight cents that they have left over from it, <laughs> right? Um, but Dr. Janet Davis, thank you very much for taking time and out of your office. I see it's been great. you've got thank a dog you. here normally, but you don't normally do, right? <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> no, you've got a boxer. Uh, Pitbull. Oh, mm-hmm. I see a picture of him up there. Okay. I, see, I see tennis balls on the floor, and I figured that it was <laughs> into work. But he's going to start chasing. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time, and um, that's about it. In the meantime, you can find us on Facebook. We have a page, and we have a group, so find us there. You can find us at MD Crabs Podcast on Twitter. You can find John at Ian Annapolis, and I am at Tim Hamilton Forty Seven. Uh, and where are you on Twitter? Um, we have a Twitter page here at the Trust. Bay Trust. <laughs> she just yes. glared at me. At, at Bay Trust. <laughs> you can email us at uh, info at themarylandcrabs.com. Our webpage is themarylandcrabs.com. Uh, um, what, what am I missing? That's enough. That's the yeah, you know, end. Stop bothering us. Goodbye. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go. Go.